Okay, I guess we're ready. Starting. Good morning. And today we are very lucky to welcome two special guests and unique leaders, Mr. Moriaki Kida and Ms. Audrey Tang. And we would like to hear their visions of the future for both Japan and the world. We will touch upon topics such as society, diversity and inclusion, digital transformation, what has changed, what changes are yet to come, and what will perhaps be left for the same. So first of all, I would like to welcome Mr. Kida and introduce himself very briefly. So first, Moriaki Kida, or Mori, is the CEO of EY Japan and has 22 years of experience in various industry sectors and has worked in several cities, including San Francisco, London, and of course, Tokyo. Mori received his bachelor's in the music and piano performance from University of California, Irvine, and Master's of Science in Business Administration from San Francisco State University. He's a licensed certified public accountant in California. Mori is passionate about mentoring members in the LGBTQ community and driving career advancement opportunities for them, not only at EY, but also outside of their organization. So thank you, Mori, for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Uh, would you have any words for the audience today? Um, just to briefly to add, uh, I, apart from practicing the piano, which really is the way I relax on the weekends, um, I currently live with my married husband, uh, Geraint in Tokyo, and also a Shiba Inu dog, which I believe in Taiwan have been used as a mascot or uh, characters, but um, we have a second one now. Thank you for having me today. I'm very privileged to be here. All right, thank you, Mori. So next, I would like to introduce Ms. Audrey Tang. So Audrey Tang, well known as Taiwan's first digital minister, became the first transgender and youngest ever government minister at the age of 35. She has leaped into prominence in Japan for creating an app that combats coronavirus by showing face mask inventory levels at a glance. Recently, she has wowed Japan and the rest of the world with her leadership on the coronavirus crisis. Thank you very much for joining us, Audrey. Yeah, really happy to be here and live long and prosper, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Would you like to add anything about yourself uh, for the Japanese audience? Sure. Um, so um, I would like to say that the mask <clears throat> availability map is the work of uh, thousands of civic technologists and certainly not myself. All I did was to code a portal to showcase the civil society's work. In a sense, uh, I'm just hollowing out the clay to make a pot. Uh, but what's in the pot is uh, the civil technologist's work. All right, great. Thank you for joining us. So first of all, I would <laughs> like to uh, jump into our first topic. Um, and I would like to ask both of you, Audrey and Maury, so my first question, what progress do you think has been made in the Japanese society and also in the world um, regarding to minority groups such as women, LGBTQIA plus individuals, immigrants and others? So let's uh, hear from Mori first. Sure. Um, I think, you know, compared to 40 years ago when I left Japan, uh, it's it's changed quite a bit and that is not just for women but for like you mentioned uh, foreign uh, born people um, for example I remember uh, people being afraid of entering an elevator when it comes and a foreign person is in it so they might uh, be startled to enter the elevator uh, back 40 years ago but um, you know, things like the, the natural or first reactions um, have changed. Also, there's been a lot of um, changes related to disabled people. Um, uh, but I also um, would like to mention LGBTQ related, um, uh, you know, movements, changes over the past 10 years in particular. Um, when, you know, as a young guy living in the United States, uh, and having my first job, 
I never considered returning back to Japan. Um, I actually had a very deep talk with my father when I came out to him uh, at the age of 16, when he was uh, asking me to go back to Japan for the university as an Asian person, that I would be more successful and have more opportunities with uh, uh, no racism if I worked and um, developed my professional career in Japan. Uh, but I had a uh, chat about being gay. Uh, I cannot return back to Japan. Um, I would have to close um, who I really am. And that's how I came out to my father. But um, here I am in Tokyo. And um, especially related to LGBTQ, uh, there's been a lot of uh, local governments that are starting to recognize partnerships for LGBT uh, people. Uh, providing uh, public housing, for example. Um, and there are many NPOs that are educating younger people, which really is my passion and what's really important. Um, and so there's, there's been quite a big difference over the past 30, 40 years in Japan in many fronts. All right, thank you. So as we heard, Mori's experience having difficulty maybe coming out in certain locations of the world um, and the different readiness of the different worlds. Um, Audrey, is there any part that you can relate and how is your kind of society around you changing as well? Yeah, um, I want to comment on uh, people in wheelchairs or people uh, who are uh, differently abled uh, either in body or in uh, neurodiversity. Back when I was a child, uh, when Taiwan was still under the martial law, uh, when the society was all about either conformance or resistance, uh, you don't see many people in wheelchairs uh, outdoors uh, on the street. And that was not because that Taiwan uh, is so healthy that people are not in wheelchairs, is that the public infrastructure was not friendly. Uh, to people in wheelchairs. Uh, there was no concept of universal design and such uh, so that they would refrain from uh, coming to the street and so on. Uh, and so I think uh, it really changed in past 30 years or so in Taiwan that uh, we now consider not only wheelchairs but also people with various different capabilities in body and in their neurodiversity to be first class citizens. Uh, and you see a lot of people in various different body conditions and mental conditions uh, on, on the street in Taiwan, uh, like nowadays, is very uh, usual. And I think this is a, a sign of a more inclusive society. And as for the intersectional nature of the uh, feminism movement in Taiwan and LGBTIQ plus uh, movements, I think uh, we really see its um, victory really uh, on the marriage equality that was passed more than a year ago now, because we legalized the uh, uh, bylaws, that is to say the same rights and duties, but not the in-laws. So when the two uh, same-sex couples wed, they wed as individuals, but their families do not wed. And this social innovation really prompted people of different generations and of different religions uh, embrace this core concept of marriage equality. And nowadays, I think we're seeing a surge of popularity and social approval. I think it's up more than 10% compared to when it was first legalized. Great, great. So yes, it's finally that these uh, societies and countries are recognizing these importance of uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, but once again, for the listeners today, uh, would you like to express what is the importance of diversity and are there any specific benefits for kind of societies, groups, and organization to recognize these? Audrey? Sure. Um, for example, um, you mentioned the mask availability map, and it's actually a really good example. Uh, back when we're starting to ration out masks, nowadays, uh, if you're an adult, you get to procure uh, from nearby pharmacies and so on, uh, nine medical masks every two weeks. If you're a child, it's 10 every two weeks. Uh, back then, we were um, deciding between uh, do we do the real name based mass rationing based on the mobile payment system, uh, for example, the easy card uh, or Visa, MasterCard and so on, uh, so that we can automatically uh, ensure that there's no double spending going on. Uh, or are we going to use the national health insurance card uh, in the pharmacies? 
Um, the first one, although we already have the system there, it doesn't take much to implement. Uh, it will only cover the people who are used to mobile payments as opposed to cash. And that's around half of our society. And our epidemiologist tells us if only half the population have mask, we might as well not ration the mask at all, because then it will not have any uh, significant effect on counter coronavirus. So we chose to build new systems based on the National Health Insurance Card, which covers more than 99.99% of citizens and residents. And for migrant workers, for example, who often do not have a SIM card uh, to their own name, uh, they maybe use prepaid card and so on. Nevertheless, they have a national health insurance card. So when we later on work with convenience stores, uh, we make sure that they can use their national health card uh, to insert into the kiosk to pre-order instead of standing in queues because many migrant workers and people who are very old, like my grandma, 87 years old, uh, do not like long queues for obvious reasons. Uh, and so because of that, they can pre-order and collect the next week. And after that, we have seen that people have accessed the system uh, numbers in the more than 90% of population, thereby effectively reducing our, uh, our value of this epidemic. So if we do not uh, consult the migrant workers, the people who are elderly, people in wheelchairs and so on, uh, when designing the system, the system will be just for uh, a few people uh, or up to 50% of people and that would actually defeat its purpose. This is just a very simple example of talking to people who are closest to the suffering to make sure that public services uh, take their uh, ideas into account. So it's not just diversity, which is the diversity of stakeholders, but really inclusion, including their ideas in decision making. That is the important part. That's wonderful to hear that Taiwan is so inclusive and all of the society members are really supporting that idea. So now I'd like to ask a question for Mori, um, who comes from more of a business background. And also I do understand that EY promotes the idea of uh, diversity and inclusion. So how is it important for businesses to incorporate these ideas into their corporate culture and so forth? And could you give us some specific examples? Sure. I mean, I, um, I think it's well, very well known that it increases productivity. Um, and you could read about all the statistics about the positive um, effects of diversity and inclusion, which both have to be there at the same time. But, um, you know, I, I would like to share, I think, my personal experience, which was that, um, as I mentioned, I, I came out at 16 and was quite active in the LGBT plus group we had on campus in the university. Um, but as I went to an, a job interview, um, I had to make a conscious decision to go back into the closet because I wanted to be competitive. And back in the 90, or, you know, mid 90s when I was looking for a job, um, it was, um, you heard about uh, being gay or lesbian as being just cause for dismissal from companies. Um, and so uh, it was competitively disadvantageous if I uh, came out in the process of job interviews. Um, <clears throat> but as I, um, you know, I went up the career ladder at the EY, um, I started to feel that while I feel technically confident. Um, I was feeling more and more less confident or inconfident when leading teams because I just had to be very careful with my words or even uh, fully include myself in conversations about talking family difficulties or um, uh, you know, disputes between team members, for example. Um, and so I've had to first accept myself uh, in the workplace that I, um, I, I should be my own self. And after having accepted myself, um, I actually felt like I was personally more included in, in the workplace, um, which led to more confidence uh, and be able to not be too careful about my ideas or um, people starting trying to figure out 
why is Maury thinking of this or why is he coming up with this idea? So personally, I really uh, believe that um, uh, from the, my experience that my personal uh, acceptance and includes, uh, inclusion has uh, really helped me be honest uh, about myself. Um, and also EY, um, you know, I think I was lucky to have um, uh, worked for a company that actually really puts respect, teaming, uh, which lead to enthusiasm, um, courage to lead, all these things that are actually in our value statement. Um, and it's one of those things that I never really paid attention, but um, in going through this process of coming out at work, I really feel the, the significance of people being themselves. Um, and I would like all of the people who are still closeted at EY, but also all the companies to feel that they could be themselves and be more contributor, uh, contributing to um, every day at work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for sharing your personal experiences. I'm going to slightly uh, shift over a topic as we already kind of have uh, to the subject of sexuality. And I would also like to ask Audrey, um, as right, a member of the LGBTQA uh, community, um, to share your personal experiences in maybe where you ever have thought that being a minority could be a handicap or not, and how have you utilized this um, to break through or use this as a, a tool of change? Um, when the uh, earliest memory of me realizing that I'm in a minority group uh, was when I was seven years old. And, and when everybody else was writing calligraphy or pencil using their right hand, I was writing with my left hand. Uh, and um, teachers told me that I'm in this like 10% minority group uh, who prefers uh, to use left handedness. But at a time, uh, because we were uh, writing, um, horizontally from left to right, writing with the left hand um, necessarily means that you're kind of obscuring the words that you write um, already. Uh, and so um, my parents and the teachers at the time kind of convinced me that uh, I can practice writing with my left hand, that's fine, calligraphy too, uh, which is right to left, by the way. Um, and so, uh, but I need to practice also right-handedness uh, in this kind of sign of conformance, uh, which wasn't easy. Uh, and so I only practiced uh, handwriting using my right hand for one year. And then um, I switched to typing, uh, never look back. Uh, and so my ha handwriting uh, remains to this day terrible uh, and I type very fast. Um, but of course, uh, you're talking about sexuality, uh, but that I think uh, is a microcosm. Uh, it is mostly about having to kind of uh, stay closeted, that is to say to hold the pencil with my right hand as a learned habit and only uh, starting writing with my left hand uh, when I'm by myself and, and so on. Of course, after the lifting of the martial law, nobody care about handedness anymore. And if you want to type really fast, you have to type with both of your hands anyway. Uh, and so MB dexterity become a uh, advantage really. Uh, and so having uh, passed uh, through two puberties, uh, once when I was 14 years old, but uh, I never really developed a high testosterone level and my natural testosterone level, according to uh, medical examiners, uh, is about the uh, level of around 80 uh, year old man. Uh, that is to say somewhere between um, female and male uh, adolescents. Uh, and so I decided uh, when I was 24 years old to enroll into female puberty, uh, taking hormones and so on. And that uh, went on for a couple more years. And I think my personal experience teaches me that having gone through two puberties, although not very deeply in either, um, makes this binary category in my mind disappear. That is to say, I do not feel that there are half of the society different from me. Rather, I share this intersectional experience uh, with pretty much everybody. So I would contest this uh, label of minority. Uh, it might be a minority of people who decide to go through two puberties or to learn uh, to ride by both hands. But once you do, it's actually maximally inclusive and actually empowers you to take all the sides. Great, great. So going through your life and coming out i think is a very important process uh, for a lot of uh, sexual minorities not everyone is comfortable doing that but both of your cases you have proven 
to find confidence somewhere throughout the, uh, your life to be able to do that and now show the world and lead the world uh, through your kind of steps. But um, if you were to be the same person, and if you were not, uh, the, uh, sorry, so I'm going to repeat my question. So do you think you would be the same person if you were not part of a sexual minority? How would this change? Does it even matter? How would that influence your right person as a, as a person, right? Uh, should I answer first? Uh, so let's ask Maury first. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> sure. I mean, I actually first like to react to Audrey, what you just mentioned about minority, um, because uh, sometimes when I share some of these stories about um, inclusion or diversity um, in Japan, you know, there's this uh, first emphasis on gender still. Um, and, and now we're talking about uh, people with disabilities or people uh, of different nationalities or, um, you know, LGBT uh, uh, plus. But, um, uh, you know, there's this force that tries to conform people not to be, uh, to be, uh, I guess, act uh, similar to your peers or your neighbors or some uh, in, in Japan. Um, and whether you are male or straight or what you would normally call a majority, um, I, I feel like everyone has some aspect that they are minority of. of. Um, and so, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I do say that I want people to be able to not think of yourself as majority, but minority of something and remember uh, how it makes you feel or how uh, you like to be supported on that or how you'd be able to share that with other people without stigma or um, discrimination. So um, I, I really reacted to what you just mentioned. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it, it was a really good point on intersectionality, which is uh, taking the vulnerability uh, of one category, but extend it as a empathy. I totally concur. So to um, Alex, to answer your question, um, I, I, I uh, you know, there's things that I think I have gained and I have lost uh, because of my sexuality. Um, but I personally, having grown up in the United States, um, felt like I was a minority, um, you know, being careful of using that word, but um, minority in two major aspects. One was obviously uh, being Asian, um, and the other was uh, after coming out uh, that I um, was gay uh, during the year era when uh, HIV was uh, not uh, treatable and people were dying in the 80s. Um, and um, I, I think what I really lost was a few of those years when, um, as I was coming out, I really felt like I belonged to nowhere. Um, I didn't, I couldn't picture my future or I couldn't picture even being working, working uh, period. Uh, and so um, there was a period of lost confidence and uh, not feeling like part of society at one point. Um, but uh, also, I think on the uh, Asian side, I was um, very, uh, I never thought of myself as Asian or I never thought of myself as Japanese. But when I moved to the United States at eight, I was bullied for uh, looking like I do. Uh, being different from my um, Western counterparts at the time. So I also went through similar experience on both of these fronts. Um, but I also have actually feel very uh, much that I gained a lot from this experience. Um, and then that's what Audrey just mentioned about um, uh, the ability to be empathetic um, and to seek what um, they're, they're hurting. And I will be the first to admit that I, I have unconscious bias and I have to keep learning, which our DNI leader continues to uh, remind me of. But um, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I lost some friends because I came out, but I also gained many friends and new family. Uh, and, 
you know, the, I, I think it was a gift in a way that I experienced uh, both of these times um, of uh, big uh, moments of feeling like a minority. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So Audrey, um, I have a question for you, or maybe for both of you. So I understand that both of you have uh, spent uh, your lives somewhat in various parts of the world throughout your maybe childhood, teens, young adults, and so forth. But I'm uh, very curious about how you think your environment and living in different parts of the world have uh, influenced you uh, to become um, the self that you are right now. And how would that be different, let's say, if you were restrained to just Taiwan or maybe just in Japan, would your maybe sexual orientation or your maybe identity as minorities in certain aspects be different or be the same? So Audrey, would you like to answer first? Sure. Um, a lot of uh, my thinking was influenced by the year that I spent in Germany <clears throat> at the border of uh, France. Uh, it's a small town called Dudweiler uh, in the Sachland uh, region. Uh, and when I was there, I was um, around 11 years old, uh, but my classmates, because I uh, study uh, in the primary schools, uh, are one year as my junior, so they're all 10 years old, but they are more mature uh, than people that I have encountered in Taiwan who are like 15 or 16 years old. And so I was wondering uh, at the time why it is so that at the same biological age, the children in Germany um, can kind of keep a schedule uh, by themselves and choose their own classes uh, and have a lot of their positions um, articulated <clears throat> very well and being um, just like adults, uh, just with a uh, smaller height. Uh, and so uh, I studied the reason why, and it turns out that it's uh, what we call the Pygmalion effect. Uh, if the adults expect children to behave like adults, the children raise to the expectation. And if the adults treat children as babies, uh, they would uh, also fulfill that expectation. So that does really changed uh, my outlook on things. Uh, instead of discriminating people on biological age, uh, instead we should uh, work with the values that they have uh, and the social expectations of them. That also led me to uh, participate in the education reform. Finally, the new curriculum we rolled out last year that emphasizes lifelong learning and transcultural intergenerational learning. Uh, on the sexual orientation side, uh, I think uh, it's really interesting because I dropped out of junior high school when I was 15 years old uh, with full blessing of the head of the school and my teachers. And the first thing I did after dropping out um, is to uh, go to the Atayala Mountains because in Taiwan nowadays we have more than 20 national languages, the majority of which are indigenous. And each indigenous nation have a very different culture. Uh, for example, the Taiwan um, uh, indigenous nation, the first nation uh, never made a, a matriarchal or patriarchal uh, structure uh, for them. Gender is <coughs> kind of irrelevant like left-handedness when choosing leaders. Uh, and there are matriarchal article uh, indigenous relations such as the Amis uh, and, and so on. And so it uh, occurred to me that even within Taiwan, there are um, like traditions that are thousands of years long and that have a different uh, configuration, a different default. When it comes to gender expression, there are indigenous nations uh, with three genders or five genders and so on. So the diversity was there right in Taiwan. And so it brought me to understand more of our uh, indigenous roots, which brought me to all the way to New Zealand uh, with the Maori people, because it shares the same Austronesian culture and some parts of the language. Well, you, you know, if you have watched the Disney film Moana uh, and so, uh, the point here I'm making is that uh, maybe just close to us uh, in the same island, there are different cultures that you can learn to look at your own upbringing from their perspective. And that uh, really transforms radically how you view your own presets uh, that you have taken for granted. So I have made uh, transculturalism a priority of my politics, uh, starting from that experience when I was 15 years old. Wow, that's amazing. So it's obvious that you were um, seeing these cultural differences, not just sexuality, but cultures, race, all this uh, from a younger age. Uh, so Maury, how could you uh, relate to this from your background 
And how do you think you would be different if you were, let's say, just restrained to Japan um, as a young adult? Um, <clears throat> so I, I really like this question because, um, you know, it, well, what if scenarios are quite different? So it, you know, difficult because I, I'm already in this situation. It's hard to go back, but I, I like it because um, it may, makes me think a lot. And the first thing, um, whether it's uh, right or not, um, I understand better what privilege means. Um, and that word has a very different meaning to many people. But if I had you know, been brought up in Japan and uh, uh, grew up only in Japan, I probably wouldn't have understood what um, certain, how some, some group of people do have advantage over um, another because of the social construct, which um, to me is what the word privilege means. Um, <clears throat> another aspect is that, um, you know, ex as I mentioned earlier, uh, having been bu bullied, uh, my first good friend in school was also a uh, immigrant that just arrived uh, to the United States from Taiwan. Um, and he and I could not speak English, so we had no way of communicating other than uh, Chinese characters. And he and I shared the same one Chinese character in our name. And um, also Doraemon, the cat uh, robot that everybody knows. And so I remember uh, finding my first good friend. Um, and uh, I also, right now, my two best friends, one is Korean, one is um, uh, uh, American-born American. And um, this multicultural experience uh, gave me curiosity for the rest of the world. Um, and that's why my husband can tell you that any time I have time to read, I'm reading about history and culture because um, I'm now curious and I'd like to learn um, what, how do people actually uh, feel sadness, joy, all these emotions, um, uh, because we all feel the same joy, but the, the, what, it, what makes people feel them, uh, the examples and situations might be different. So um, I, I really like learning, uh, learning that. And also languages, because uh, languages are not only tools of communication, I think, but it also reflects the culture. And um, learning about how even uh, Taiwanese uh, Chinese uh, people write certain expressions versus mainland Chinese or even American Chinese can be different. Uh, using the same Chinese characters. So I think these kind of things, uh, I, I'm just very curious to learn about development. So mm -hmm. um, overall, it's learning about privilege and uh, having really instilled the curiosity uh, and empathy to learn about different things. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences. I think that was very inspiring, but also shows the importance of kind of exposure and understanding yourself um, and how you could be different in certain parts of the world, being a majority, minority, and so forth. So uh, thank you very much for sharing. So here, uh, we'd like to take a very short break uh, to get some air through the room. So if we can take a five minute quick intermission and maybe two minutes, three minutes, then uh, we'll get back to our talk session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Audrey, can you yes. hear me? May I ask yes, you one question about um, something I read, which is related to English education? Sure. I don't think this is the formal part of the interview, okay. but um, okay. English for a, a Taiwanese people. Um, you know, sometimes I feel we, we're trying to do that as well in our uh, company here, EY e e Tokyo, but or Japan, but um, I. I feel sometimes I'm imposing my own ability to speak in English uh, to our people, although it's quite necessary in business. How do you explain or um, what is your thinking behind the importance of English language? Yeah, I, I learned English very late uh, in my life, maybe when I was 15 years old. Uh, and that's uh, because not because of business, but because I got into a game called Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's a collectible uh, card game. 
Uh, and at the time, it was not translated into kanji, so I had to learn English to play the game. Uh, and so my main suggestion would just be to find something that you're interested in that involves lots of English speakers. Uh, later on, I would join the free software movement. Of course, uh, the main communication in that movement is in English. Uh, and so, yeah, maybe it's easier if people learn, I don't know, Scratch or JavaScript uh, or math. Uh, and then en enroll into a community where English is the default because after all, uh, language is what you use to talk to other people and, and really uh, it doesn't work without a critical mass of people. Nowadays, of course, you can simulate people uh, with Duolingo or some other apps, uh, but the same principles still apply that it has to be in the flow of work, uh, in the flow of daily life. Uh, rather than something that you uh, dedicate like two hours a day to. I, I found that immersive learning, even though very uh, shallow, uh, that is to say not using a lot of hard vocabulary, eventually builds the sense of language better and, and easier. Mm. Do you personally speak more than English and Chinese? Well, I mean, when I, uh, my first language is uh, Dai Yi, uh, the uh, Taiwanese Holok. Uh, so that's my grandma's uh, language. Uh, and when I was in Germany, of course, I speak a little bit of German, but and also France because we're at a border. But je ne parle pas français now. So uh, the um, I think uh, you acquire a, a language when there's a need to it. But I don't keep uh, that language uh, too much because um, there's machine translation for most of my uh, business and work needs. Uh, at the moment. So I think in English now and rely mostly on machine translation. Wow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a actually really interesting topic about language and becoming, uh, I think, how Taiwan is pushing for bilingualism. So maybe I'll touch upon that topic a little bit later on so we can um, go deeper okay. into it. So that was a uh, rehearsal after all. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, for both of you, Audrey and Maury, if you feel like uh, you want to comment or ask each other questions, uh, please feel free to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, I'll only uh, speak up when I need to kind of give you new topics to talk about. So uh, getting back into this, um, I would like to move on to our third topic of the day. Um, and we want to talk about love and family, right? So how are the ideas around concepts such as love and family changing? around you? How do you feel about this concept? Do you feel change? Is it still not changing? Uh, please share some of your experience. So uh, let's start with uh, Maury. Okay, so um, you know what's really positive in the recent years in Japan is that the surveys show that majority of Japanese people now support gay marriage uh, and or equal marriage, sorry, and um, you know, for Taiwan, our country, uh, our, our uh, ma managing partner in Taiwan, uh, Andrew Fu, has uh, supported that the Taiwanese gay marriage or the equal marriage. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think the um, now it's coming to a, a point where I think the corporations uh, in Japan uh, could play a bigger role, not just relying on governments to you know, government entities to support, although grassroots um, local movements in Japan has been increasing this partnership um, movement, uh, which is not the same as equal marriage, but it is the first step. Um, I think what I have heard here, as well as in the United States, United Kingdom and other countries, which um, also now have uh, equal marriage, is uh, this term traditional family values or traditional family in Japanese, uh, you know, they say dento tekina kazoku, for example, or what is natural. Um, and uh, I always question this word traditional uh, because um, tradition is something we create over time, but it also changes over time. And so if you go back in Japanese history, just to talk about Japan, uh, 300 years ago, the shape of love was very different um, or expression of love was very different. Um, or if you go back 50 or 60 years ago, pre-war, there were a lot of um, uh, early deaths, 
uh, where uh, mothers or fathers would die at a young age, and so the mother or the father may remarry. So what we call as traditional family with two parents who are married forever uh, until they die at an old age, that is not really tradition. So um, I really do question that. But I also um, would like to refer to certain books related to um, homosexuality in non-human beings, uh, because there are a lot of science books. Um, there was a book called The Color of the Rainbow that I read about 20, you know, 15 years ago, done by a, a, scientist, a research scientist on how um, uh, homosexuality exists in different um, animals. So, um, you know, again, the word natural or in natural is something that really needs to be considered. Um, but um, so those things are kind of the first things I think about as we progress towards equal marriage in various countries. And I'm, I'm, I'm so proud Taiwan has uh, equal marriage now. Great, great. So Audrey, what is your views and how has your environment been changing about the ideology of love and family? How, how do you think this is changing right now? Well, love is love, uh, and I really do not think that there is a material uh, difference uh, between, like, uh, so when people ask me of my <coughs> sexual orientation, um, I, my standard answer is that I'm sapiosexual, that is to say I love homo sapiens, uh, and uh, of course I'm sure that all of us here are homo sapiens, uh, and that is the, the standard uh, answer that I give, and, and there's some truth in it. It means that uh, when love happens between two individuals, uh, it is not because of some categories or things like that. It is just a natural expression of human nature. Uh, on the other hand, <coughs> family really is a social construct. And as I mentioned in the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> let's do this again, All right? So, but on the fam family, on the other hand, is a social construct. Um, I really like uh, how Mori uh, traces back in a history to see that family is constructed in various different ways. And indeed, in Taiwanese history, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, on the immigrants of the Minnan, uh, they have this idea of uh, like blood oath brothers, uh, and uh, it's began as a kind of social ceremony, but then that idea became uh, just uh, what we will nowadays call homosexual couples, uh, not to mention the more than 16 different indigenous nations, each have their own very different uh, ideas of families. And that is partly why uh, when we legalized marriage equality, we took this idea of uh, legalizing only the individual to individual parts, leaving the family to family parts to cultural uh, interpretations, and that is uh, the cultural nature of things. And uh, incidentally, it also reduced the uh, um, resistance uh, from the part of the society that uh, insists on this uh, to people wedding forever, their families wed, kinship, and so because they don't see as threatening uh, as uh, the redefining marriage uh, idea or the proposal of marriage equality. So maybe that's also something that Japan can consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I'm very curious, as we talk about the notion of the traditional family, right, but as both Japan and Taiwan is moving be beyond right, accepting this equal marriage, what would a new family look like? And what would be the roles of family be in society moving forward? What do you think, uh, Maury? Mm, I don't know, actually, um, because it evolves so much and I cannot predict the future. But, um, you know, we are moving more from a bigger or a, a bigger family to smaller families in almost individualism. Marriage might mean something completely different or even meaningless at some point in the future. So I, 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 I can't tell. But um, there is also uh, in most uh, many people the, uh, the need to be with someone or need to feel like they care for someone um, or to take, you know, um, take uh, the care of health or well-being of someone. There, there might be this innate nature. So um, it may not be defined by uh, gender. It may not be defined by 
uh, social expectation of age or um, anything as you know in the US you know it used to only be between the people of same races or um, you know something like that so I think it's a commitment really to help one another um, or um, uh, several people maybe together to raise a child together or something like that so um, I'm actually excited about how the uh, definition of what marriage will evolve in the next generation. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Andre, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I totally agree. Uh, I mean, I'm a uh, avid uh, reader of Wittgenstein, the philosopher, when I was young. And Wittgenstein, uh, in his book, um, um, Philosophical Investigations, uh, proposed this idea of family resemblance, uh, meaning that one word, even though like family, uh, it may mean very different things to uh, people, and we recognize family uh, relationships uh, when we see it, but not necessarily uh, identical or even sharing any common feature uh, with our uh, used uh, term of family uh, in our own family. Uh, and so I, I would say that family, the word itself, is going through this family resemblance uh, part. Whereas uh, the essentialism, that is to say that the family is defined by some essential feature, still um, exists in some part of our legal code. What we're trying to do nowadays is to relax uh, those essential featureism and making sure that uh, when people feel that they are in the family, we respect their idea of family. And that is, I think, what's important, that is people in the family recognize it as a family. And that's what family resemblance means in philosophy. Interesting, interesting. Um, so as we make progresses about uh, the open-mindedness of uh, families and ideologies around that, it is still also true that a lot of uh, sexual minorities face difficulties kind of opening up or maybe is limited by law in uh, becoming married and so forth. But as members of society, uh, how can we support these young members right, of societies who are facing these difficulties um, overcome these hurdles, or what can we do as individuals to help these people? Audrey? Okay, uh, we in the uh, Taiwanese cabinet office, uh, this building, uh, which is called the Executive Yuan, uh, so incidentally also EY, my email address is at <laughs> ey.gov.tw, um, uh, really <laughs> supports uh, people of various different um, gender orientation, uh, gender and sexual orientation and uh, physical expressions and body positivity and so on through what we call gender mainstreaming process. This process has been going on in the executive UN in the EY uh, for more than 12 years now. And I, I think it's a really good example of how organizational innovation can lead uh, to a real change in social impact. Basically, each uh, major bill, uh, each uh, major program that runs for a while or more years need to pass through the Gender Equality Committee, which is by design one more seat in the civil society organization compared to the minister's seats. Uh, and so I think it's 18 uh, civil society experts and 17 ministers. And the committee reviews each and every proposals, bills, and so on to find the gender impact that it may have, negative or positive. And then we build a gender impact dashboard that continue to collect the important statistics even well after the program has run its course. And what this means is that we have evidence-based policy making that can inform people and we have a very clear KPI. For example, nowadays in our parliament, there's more than 40 percent women and that uh, we have, for example, in our newly constructed buildings um, by default, like in my office, the Social Innovation Lab, there's uh, four bathrooms, uh, the universal one, the gender neutral one, the female one and the male one and so on. And so these uh, starts as small innovations, but through the gender impact assessment and gender equality committee's work, it permeates to all the organizational public servants, even though they would say initially that they work in the Ministry of Finance or whatever that has ostensibly nothing to do with gender equality, they will have to consult uh, the gender equality committee on each and every bills uh, and uh, all the different programs. And that builds into our young public service uh, a progressive uh, viewpoint that 
that they work as public servants are there positively to encourage people to essentially come out and share and enjoy and bring their own personal experiences as their unique contribution to the workforce. Uh, and so I think some sort of uh, this kind of exoskeletal gender impact uh, dashboard and evaluation criteria as their organizational innovation, I think is really important. That's great. I find it really amazing how the Taiwanese government it's taking so much leadership to, to drive this new change. And I think there's a lot uh, that the Japanese government can also learn uh, from Taiwan. Uh, but Mori, uh, is there anything specific that really um, caught your attention that maybe the Japanese government or maybe Japanese society as a whole could learn from these actions? Um, <clears throat> well, everything that Audrey just talked about is something that we could uh, learn. Um, because I think, again, there's... Uh, relatively specific focus on gender right now, but binary mid gender uh, by the um, Japanese politic, uh, political parties. But um, there, it, the, the definition of gender is still binary and very specific. So I think, um, you know, your, your example of four different types of bathroom that shows um, a, a lot more um, flexibility in def defining um, for gender. But in um, kind of reaction, reacting to what you just mentioned, Audrey, um, you know, in a corporate world, it sometimes feels like we're always competing for a, a, a finite resource. And I read about your, um, you know, the S SDG um, circle mm -hmm. that um, things are not necessarily polarized um, the way you have approached um, uh, political movements using social media. Um, but there, you know, we always come back to this. We have limited resources. You're spending too much time on LGBT, or you're spending too much time on disability issues or um, gender. Um, so you need to do more of this and less of this. And it almost always seems like we're competing um, against each other where I feel like the intersectionality is where we could start with what is common but is is there something a tip that you could give even to the corporate world on how we should try to get away from a uh, finite resource zero-sum game kind of discussion I'm, I'm sorry yeah, that's cer certainly certainly yeah um, uh, I always uh, talk to our uh, social innovators in the social innovation lab uh, that because we're giving out awards the social innovation partnership award not to particular organizations but rather to unlikely partnerships uh, so building unlikely partnerships is really in the DNA of achieving the SDGs together in Taiwan. That necessarily means that the social innovators, when they're talking to big corporations, instead of talking just to the CSR uh, department, the Department for uh, Social Responsibility, which does have only a limited uh, resource, they instead, uh, I encourage them to talk to the business development department, which would reshape the brand of that particular organization thanks to the influx of new idea that comes out of the social innovations. I will use one example. Um, our Central Epidemic Command Center, which uh, used to hold a live streamed uh, press conference every day during the pandemic days, we're now post pandemic, so, uh, but uh, for more than uh, three months, they have held these daily press conferences. And I always uh, ensure that this broadcasted uh, live press conference is not only translated into funny memes by a cute spokes dog uh, that you <laughs> refer to, but also that anyone who have any input uh, from any part of society can just dial this toll-free number 1922 and share their social innovations with the CECC. Uh, and there are, for example, a young boy uh, whose family called 1922 saying, my boy doesn't want to go to school because Eurasian mask and all we got was pink medical masks. And uh, my boy doesn't want to wear pink medical mask because he said he will certainly be bullied uh, in school if he wear a pink medical mask. Now, instead of saying that, oh, we have only finite resources, this is the mask that we have got. Uh, what if uh, we give them a white or a uh, cyan or a blue mask? We have limited uh, supply of those masks. We cannot get every boy uh, the color of the mask that they need. Uh, we instead 
just talk to the leadership and the uh, uh, open government participation officer from the Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, who lives with that spokes dog, by the way. All he had to do is to take pictures of the dog uh, to translate into a meme. Uh, he talked to the Ministry of Health and uh, Welfare saying, uh, what if you all just start putting on pink medical mask the next time you come to the press conference? And they did. And so um, the participation officer convinced the leadership as a kind of business development with young boys uh, and, and showing gender mainstreaming solidarity. And they kept wearing pink medical masks for extended days and actually changed all their social media icons and things like that pink. And so the boy became, of course, the most hip boy in the class because only he had uh, the mask that the heroes wear. Uh, and that is, I think, a really good uh, example of business development, really uh, reshaping your brand to talk to a new segment of society that used to feel uh, alienated or not connected to you thanks to their own input. So that's just one illustration. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I would like to slightly switch topics now, um, move beyond sexuality, but now talk about how the world is changing. And uh, because of the uh, corona pandemic, um, a lot of us especially everyone across the world, now works differently, provides value to the world uh, in different ways. And I would like to hear from both of you, um, how are working styles changing, not just in Japan, but all over the world? How do people create value and how should we be changing? What kind of open mindset should we be having? So Mori, would you like to take this? Sure. Um, there's. I, I feel that there has been enormous um, pressure created for certain different people or similar people, depending on circumstances. For example, um, in, in Japan, women have always had to carry on more of the household work, which actually increased in the workload um, uh, due to the gender stereotype of roles um, that women have to, to, to carry on. Um, and or care, caring for the elderly that um, again um, I think the research already shows that women are carrying more load um, of caring for family members not just children but their elderly parents. Um, I also do um, have heard in the LGBT community for example that the um, people are feeling even more isolated uh, because uh, they're not necessarily out at home where they're ma they may be living with their parents uh, and they are unable to go to uh, social settings where they were able to be themselves without worrying about themselves. So there has been um, uh, undue pressure created for some uh, por uh, portion of people who also, I think, work uh, at EY. Uh, and so I think we need to continue to help and recognize um, that and try to distribute the, um, the pressure to different, uh, uh, pe all the different people. But also, um, I feel like um, I found, I, I've heard some strange things too, which I will share, but um, web conferences have actually created a more equal footing for many people. Um, for example, in the past, in a meeting, if you did not speak up, you would never uh, be seen or heard. But now, in a meeting, you see that somebody is participating visually just because you're in, in the meeting. Um, and so there are certain aspects that have brought up different people. Uh, and it, it actually, as um, a partner, I can actually call on some people that um, a, a little bit more uh, naturally, or even text somebody to say, oh, can you speak about this next topic next? I will um, call on you. So um, uh, it, it creates a different uh, kind of um, equality that we probably could not have uh, achieved or attained in the past. So um, I, I really would like to continue taking advantage of some of these um, things. The fi fun funny thing that I've heard is that a Japanese company have recent uh, has uh, have companies have recently asked for a uh, conference um, um, call facility facility company 
to see if the president and the vice president can appear bigger on the conference call and can stay stationary <laughs> at the top of the screen where all the rest of the in, uh, employees are um, uh, uh, smaller and you know at the bottom of the screen. Um, at least that um, I find that quite funny, but reflects the Japanese culture. But um, I think majority of the companies that I've spoken to is not asking for that. Uh, and <laughs> We, of course, at EY is not asking for that. It actually is great, I feel, that everybody's appearing the same size um, and have equal uh, presence. So, yeah, those are the things that I have. To say. Yeah, I have a funny story related to that. Uh, I first had my uh, interview when it was confirmed that I will become digital minister uh, in September uh, 2016. And my first interview was given to uh, people who want to interview me who are primary and secondary school students. Uh, and I was in Paris at the time and they were in Taiwan, in Taipei. Uh, and so instead of a web conference, we decided to use virtual reality. Uh, I did a 3D scan of myself uh, and they also uh, did their own avatar and we meet uh, in the HTC Vive uh, powered uh, this virtual reality conference room. And so just before entering into the conference room, I scaled down my avatar. So I'm at the same height as the younger uh, kids because I'm uh, one meter and 80 uh, centimeters high. I'm almost double the height to some of the uh, younger kids. But once I shrink my avatar to the same height as they are, suddenly we find that we interact much more naturally uh, and that they can just speak directly to me without looking up to me and so on. And so I think a lot of those physical, acoustic and so on constraints is really um, changed by this uh, web conferencing, including virtual reality. But we have to be, of course, intentional in designing the social interactions about that. Mm. I have another example um, similar in that, you know, positive outcome, which is related to some of the LGBT um, activities we have had at EY. Um, in, in the past, we've led LGBT uh, out of um, countries that have no laws against LGBT. So for example, in Asia, it would be Australia, um, Tokyo, um, you know, um, Hong Kong, um, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, not Singapore, but um, actually Singapore is one of those examples where, or Malaysia, where it has been very difficult for us to have LGBT related activities um, very widely. But um, we've been able to do Asia Pacific LGBT meetings where we talk about participants we had from Taiwan, we had from Japan. Um, uh, that experience, uh, shared experiences, uh, because it's virtual, that um, because you didn't need to physically fly somebody in. So there are certain opportunities that actually have been created because of this. And there are certain things, even without the pandemic, we will definitely continue on. Definitely. So earlier, um, I caught you guys uh, talking a little bit about the importance of speaking English um, in this uh, changing environment. But it is also true that people are becoming a little less mobile uh, just right now because of the coronavirus, but also connected more digitally uh, using tools and so forth. And I would like to ask you a little bit about how you think globalization um, will be happening in, these, in this current, current world and how is it important to be able to speak English or be bilingual. Um, Audrey, do you want to take this? Sure. Um, I, I think in English, but English is not my first language. I learned English only when I was 15 years old, uh, when I uh, played this card game, uh, Magic the Gathering. Um, and so uh, my first language is uh, Taiwanese Holok or Dai Yi, uh, and then uh, Mandarin, of course, and then um, German, and then a little bit of French. Uh, and so I think uh, having gone through uh, those different languages and now think in English, uh, I think what's really important is that uh, the more language you learn, the easier learning a new language becomes. The more culture that you acquaint yourself to, the easier it is to accept new cultures. So in a sense, language is not only about that particular language, but each language connects you to more languages 
and more coaches. And I think uh, in the age of globalization, what we are looking at is uh, what we call globalism, right? Uh, you share your local language, your local culture using the devices uh, invented by people of different cultures in different languages so that you see your own culture from a transcultural viewpoint and your culture also helps other culture to see themselves from a transcultural viewpoint. I think that is really helpful because thanks to the pandemic, we now understand we're all on the same spaceship uh, called Earth. Uh, and this is uh, way past time um, when tackling global issues such as uh, climate change, this information crisis and things like that, uh, if we have this sense of transculturalism and a shared globe. Mm -hmm. So Maury, uh, so globalization is obviously happening slightly in a different way than we originally imagined, but do you have any thoughts about how this will, how globalization will keep on going uh, in this modern world? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm a strong believer that because of the internet that the global, globalization will continue to accelerate rather than, I think some uh, pessimistic view is that we're becoming more nationalistic and we're becoming more inward or local centric. Um, I think, um, you know, it, it will continue. But um, on this um, topic of language, um, you know, we, we, I had no way of uh, reading a Facebook posting of a friend in um, Finland before, but uh, although crude, I could still understand now and read what my friend is posting. Um, also, even in the English language, um, you know, um, Americans now say cheers, which were only said by um, British or I think Australian people. So, <laughs> so I think um, the, the language really uh, is also continuously changing and connecting people in different ways. So um, I, I think the globali globalization in language is an essential mix. But um, I really liked what you said, Audrey, earlier about bringing fun or interest with mm -hmm. uh, learning languages. Um, for example, I, I'm a horrible German speaker, but I really liked um, uh, reading about uh, history from a German perspective of Japan. So I, right now I'm reading um, a German book on, on um, uh, the early 1900s relationship between Germany and Japan, and I'm trying to learn that. But because of the interest, I could go through this tedious um, translation of uh, the, the word. So your game experience or um, things that uh, not just for the sake of learning a language, but to learn something else using that language. Um, actually, I, I didn't really think of that as a good way to mix um, uh, bring fun into it, just like you're bringing fun into politics. Mm -hmm. that, that's right, that's right. Uh, it extends even to uh, artificial languages uh, such as Scratch or JavaScript or uh, Python, uh, because you learn this language is not because you want to be a programmer, but rather there's something that you would like the program to do and it's fun to uh, just work on each other's works, uh, remixes. And I think remixes is really powerful because it has a intrinsic uh, social direction of development. And, and that is nowadays like through Duolingo, uh, which is a lot of remixing communities, people voluntarily translating and so on uh, in a way that is mediated by the interaction space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Audrey, earlier you were mentioning your strong uh, interest in the area of ed education. And I also know that Taiwan is really pushing forward uh, bilingual education and wants oh, yeah. to make, make the nation yes. a bilingual nation by 2030. Why is That's this right. so important um, and how would this impact the way we work moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, by bilingual, we uh, do not necessarily mean Taiwanese Mandarin and English. It could be Amis and English, uh, Hakka and English, and so on. So uh, their uh, native language and English. Uh, the importance here is twofold. 
First is that thinking in English uh, connects you to a lot of communities around the world that use this language as a uh, lingua franca or rather anglica uh, of that particular uh, community. Uh, the programming community really is a really good uh, example. And the second, it also makes uh, people who are of different cultures find Taiwan more welcoming. If you come to Taiwan and only see the signage and so on in a local language, it kind of pushes people away. But nowadays, we hand out gold cards. You can uh, go to Taiwan for uh, travel or for tourism and suddenly decide that you really like Taiwan, maybe because we're pandemic uh, free now. Uh, and then people would just apply for a gold card because they are digital nomad. They can work anywhere. And so they just convert their tourist visa into a three uh, year stay uh, that uh, includes a work permit, residence permit, and they can get a health insurance after six months. But they would only do this um, decision it is commitment uh, to live in Taiwan if Taiwan is friendly to them. And English, of course, uh, is something that's seen as more inclusive than any local language, especially if they come from American or European or African uh, backgrounds. And so that is the main point of the Taiwan Goat Cart, uh, the com, uh, community. Uh, they have, I think, more than 100 people now, and each of them trying to get more people uh, to stay in Taiwan. And they are also very much uh, looking into all our, not only digital, but any public services to make sure that that even as simple as road signs and so on have the correct uh, English on them so that it creates an inclusive environment for people with all coaches. Right. I, I, um, I have an interesting reaction because um, I think one um, fear I have is that people who do speak English in the business community have, in Japan have more privileged than those who don't and how do um, how can I continue to address the um, advantage that English speaking business people in Japan have over those not have and um, I think in increasing literacy is a uh, an important aspect um, <clears throat> but I also um, you know am for uh, what you say about bilingualism because um, maybe Taiwan is not much of an issue because you're, you have one of the highest um, freedom of speech expression, you know, levels of any place, um, uh, many places around the world, uh, even compared to Japan. But um, even reading about the pandemic in the Japanese press uh, is quite limiting in terms of amount of information. Uh, whereas if you extend your language just to English, you now are able to read um, how Taiwanese English papers are describing about the Japan. Um, so you now have an outside in look about who you are, who your identity is. Um, and it actually makes you uh, more humble and smaller uh, and to, um, to understand yourself a little bit better. So I think um, what you talked about uh, welcoming foreign uh, people to uh, Taiwan, uh, even con uh, communicate, uh, allowing people to communicate English when their native language is different within Taiwan, maybe. Um, that might be helpful. I also like the fact that it extends um, your uh, view, uh, your uh, view of yourself by looking from outside in uh, using English as one of the languages. Yeah, definitely. And by the way, our three year uh, uh, goat cards are uh, you can apply it again after it expires. And I've heard many people who uh, want to reapply or stay in Taiwan for five years, uh, take advantage of our dual citizenship offering. So they become also Taiwanese while retaining their original nationality. And so this is not just bilingualism, but rather a uh, binationality, uh, as uh, we are referring to. And I think it really uh, is a good way uh, to uh, as I mentioned, a transcultural identity of, of the, the nation, of the Republic citizens, because then we are not defining ourselves on any particular culture, but defining ourselves as an open innovation uh, sandbox of sorts that would uh, make this transculturalism work. Very, very interesting. Very interesting. So I think both of you shared the idea of by, by being able to speak English, being bilingual, be bicultural, <laughs> You have much more access to the world. You are able to relate to so many more people across the world. And I think this information, right, being able to understand 
uh, gaining access to information is such an important factor. And Audrey, I also know that you're a very strong advocate for transparency, and that is mm -hmm. one of your core policies <clears throat> throughout mm -hmm. everything. How, how sure. is transparency so important? Why is it so important? Uh, and what can, let's say, corporations learn from the idea of transparency? How could it benefit sure. them? Sure. Um, I have to qualify that, though. Uh, I mean transparency by making the state our work transparent to citizens. It does not mean making the citizens transparent to the state, which would be surveillance uh, state. Uh, and so this one way transparency uh, from the state to the citizens is basically an idea of making trust earned, like trustworthiness. Uh, instead of blindly trust the state or blindly trusting the national health insurance to ration the mask properly, anyone queuing in the line can check their own phone. Uh, and if you uh, are a person with blindness, for example, there are also chatbots, voice assistants, and so on. More than 100 ways for you to confirm that people queuing before you have indeed uh, reduced the stock of the ph pharmacy by nine or 10 if they are a child. And the people who are queuing after you can also participatory account for your purchase. And so this makes this uh, trust between social sector organizations much more natural to, to earn. This is the same idea of a distributed ledger, making sure that uh, accountants uh, working in different jurisdictions and so on can come to a rough consensus much more quickly uh, thanks to the transparency enabled uh, by ledger technology. And we use these technologies not to uh, change how the society works, but rather to reaffirm that the society have a absolute freedom of speech, of assembly, and so on, to take those source materials that we publish anywhere and to make analysis, for example, on the over and under supply that eventually led to us working with 24 hour convenience stores or the taking our transcripts and our interview video like this very one that I will publish on YouTube under Creative Commons and even sample them as hip hop rap songs by those monos uh, in Japan. And these are all applications that I have no way of foreseeing, but then it uh, shows the value of real transparency in that we do not restrict the uses to the one that can uh, be imagined by us beforehand, but rather it allows all sort of creative workers uh, to reinterpret our work uh, in unanticipated ways. And that's innovation for you. Okay, great. So we can definitely see that Taiwan is leading in terms of the idea of implementing transparency into the social sector. Uh, but I have a question uh, for Mori as one of the leaders of a company that engages in auditing services. I think transparency is a very important uh, idea as well. How, how is that, what does transparency mean to you and why is it so important, Mori? Yeah, so um, from a corporate standpoint at EY, there are two ways I kind of see this. One is in our services. And then the other is how we exist as a company for our employees and our um, society. Um, and for example, for the service side, um, you know, audit or assurance services, uh, companies are very concerned right now about what non-financial uh, values that they can also communicate to the public that the um, traditional financial statements, which includes the uh, balance sheet based on market value and uh, P&L, the profit and loss statement based on just the period's activities is not enough. That um, there are certain intangibles that the company have. So EY has participated in a, a project called um, uh, in, um, a long-term value project in, in the UK and we have a proposal on how companies can continue to disclose those non-financial um, or intangible values to the public. Um, there are a lot of companies that give back to the employees or society not just from a um, uh, uh, you know e e um, uh, a what do you call societal giving kind of a donation type of work but actually doing it because they believe in it and we we try to figure out how in our services how companies can disclose that um, another is really about our own um, company and the transparency of um, what we do and I think in the last few years 
uh, we have continued to actually not only talk about uh, what we do, but why we do it and um, what struggles we are having. So in, in the past, I think traditional Japanese companies have uh, always been this strong, we know what we're doing, trust us type of um, uh, corporate culture. But EY has this culture um, or purpose of better building a better working world. And we really believe that we should share some of the struggles, some of the difficult decisions that we're trying to make and soliciting feedback on what might be good good in your view. So it's not a top down, but it's also um, uh, bottoms up approach as well. Um, so that we don't, um, the stewards of the companies are everyone and not just the, the management. So um, I think the, the world is moving towards more of a collective um, individual uh, um, uh, movement uh, rather than just uh, top of uh, the organization who have privilege making decisions uh, to benefit the rest of the firm. So that's, I think, the change that we're starting to see. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, we are perhaps seeing peak hierarchy. That is to say, adding more hierarchy will not actually change or improve our ways to solve structural, social, and environmental issues. So even the most hierarchical organizations in Taiwan, including the cabinet office and the ministries, uh, now have to work with uh, hashtags. We now have participation offices, uh, such as the person who lived with a spokes dog that I alluded to, uh, whose whole, whole job is talking to hashtags. And, and this really is a, a new idea, right? Uh, previously, you have offices that talk to journalists, but they know wh which journalists they're talking to. They have uh, officers that talk to uh, MPs, but they know which parliamentarian they are talking to. But a participation officer that talks to hashtags, uh, nobody knows who is behind those hashtags, but yet you have to engage those hashtags, including, of course, hashtag that demand accountability uh, on social return of value, demanding accountability on the social impact that we are having, an environmental one too. Yeah. All right, so I'd love to keep on going. We're hearing some great ideas from the two leaders today, but I would uh, start like to wrapping up uh, with one last question for both of you. So my last question, is what is something that you would like to achieve by 2030 and how do you envision the world to be by then? So I would like to ask Audrey first. Okay, uh, by 2030, uh, all the global goals are supposed to be met. Uh, but I think uh, my main focus, of course, is on goal 17. I'm even wearing the color of goal 17 with me today, uh, which is partnership uh, for the goals. And the partnership to the goals, if you look into the specific items, uh, it talks about three things that I think are very important, not to uh, people working in digital, but rather people working anywhere. And they are uh, 1718, which is enhancing availability of reliable data. 1717, encouraging effective partnerships. And then uh, 17, uh, six, making sure that the innovations are open to be shared across sectors instead of only in silos. And all those three uh, different uh, specific car targets builds a, a new worldview. That is to say people who work in the economic sector, the social sector, in the environment and so on, need to transform both digitally and sustainably into organizations that are not uh, for, for profit, but with purpose. Rather, they need to be for purpose, but with profit. And that is the main idea change that would predict that we will see by the year 2030. All right, great. Thank you. So, Maury, same question to you. What would you like to achieve by 2030? And how do you envision the world to be by then? Um, I don't have something. I should have gone first, uh, having seen something so concrete from <laughs> Audrey. But, um, you know, my my difficulty really was in my process of coming out as a gay man. Um, and there still are suicides or bullying that happen um, in, in various parts of the world. So one of my personal goals is to address these, 
um, and to create a more emp empathetic um, environment for those who are um, what we uh, call minorities, um, not just LGBT, but those who feel like there is no home to them in um, any society. Um, and that seems like such a, a huge thing, but um, personally, I, I really like to um, uh, work for um, uh, teenage, um, those who are going through puberty through the university system so that they can have hope for the future. Um, and as a corporation, I think this uh, democratization, decentralization of decision making um, and to uh, create less um, difference in either earnings or decision making power between the top and, and, and the bottom, I think that's where um, I, th uh, I really would like to get to. Um, and lastly, as a society, um, you know, this is more of a dream than what's probably possible. But Audrey, your, um, it's really inspiring to hear your view of Taiwan accepting different types of people from outside of Taiwan. And I really hope that we get to a point where there's a lot more borderless communication uh, movement of people, that um, there's less emphasis on your uh, differences, but your commonalities, as, as you mentioned. So the intersectionality is something that I really would like to see. Great. All right. So today we were very lucky to have uh, Audrey and Maury join us and to hear from these two leaders about how the world may change, what they think about what's happening, but also get inspired and to look forward to a positive future. For, so thank you very much for joining us today and let's hope for a much better future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And again, live long and prosper. All right. Thank you very much, Audrey. It was Thank a you. privilege to have spoken to you and all the time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you. Perfect.